This is your ultimate stop for everything sports. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Should I say more? From the NFL, MLB, the NBA, to MMA. It's all in here. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Listen now. Hello, 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 and welcome back to the GSMC Sports Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, Alex Masper. Thank you so much for tuning into today's episode and to be continuing to listen to the show. If you are a returning listener, we really do appreciate you. Before I start talking anything sports, I want to remind you all of a couple of things. First, please, please, please subscribe to the podcast on whatever podcasting app or website you are listening to this on. To do that, you can just go to our homepage and hit the subscribe button. If you're on you know, Apple Podcasts, it'll be in the top right-hand corner with next to that plus sign that says subscribe. You want to subscribe to the podcast for a couple of reasons, but the main one being you get those alerts and those notifications on your phone, on your laptop, on your watch, on whatever you may be listening to this episode on. And you can always know when we drop a new episode of the GSMC Sports Podcast here at the GSMC Podcast Network. Again, please, please, please subscribe to the podcast. So you can get those alerts and notifications and that way you can never miss an episode and be one of the first people to listen to a new episode when we release it again. Please, please, please subscribe to the podcast. We'd also really appreciate it if you could leave us a five-star review or just a positive review on that same podcasting app or website on that same device. Uh, just to give us a boost of confidence to let us know that you guys are enjoying the content and discussion points and the structure of the show. And if you are, again, we would really appreciate it if you leave us a five-star review or just a positive review in general uh, on that same Apple Podcasts or Spotify or Podbean, whatever you might be listening to this on. Again, same thing. Just go to the homepage and click leave a review. That would give us a uh, big boost of confidence. Again, it would let us know that you guys are enjoying the structure of the show and everything about it. So that would be awesome if you could. And finally, if you could follow us on all social media platforms, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram is where you can primarily follow us. Over there, we can interact and pretty much talk about anything over on social media. We can talk about sports. We can talk about life. We can do some live tweeting of some big-time hockey games or baseball games when the season starts. Whatever it may be, all of those interaction needs can be found on social media. So, again, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram is where you can primarily follow us, and we would love if you could do so. Uh, I hope wherever you are and however you may be listening, you and your family are happy and healthy during these extremely trying times in the world today. We've got a fantastic show for you all today. Coming up later on in the show, I want to tell you why this important NBA team is finally back on track after a slow start to their season, why they could be a big threat to the Brooklyn Nets in the East, maybe even as currently constructed. I also want to get to some college basketball, actually. March Madness is next week, and I want to talk about some of my favorite draft prospects, specifically Cade Cunningham and why I think he is legit, and I think he is just as good as Zion Williamson was coming out of Duke. I think Cade Cunningham is that good of a college basketball prospect, so I'll be talking about him at the very end of today's show. And we're also going to be doing a deep dive on a lot of NFL news that has come out over the past couple of days. Cam Newton is back with the New England Patriots, surprisingly, on a one-year uh, incented uh, laced $14 million deal. We'll get into that. We'll get into the trade that the Miami Dolphins did to acquire all-pro linebacker uh, Bernard McKinney. Uh, we'll get into that and what that means for the Miami Dolphins and their defense. And we'll get into the New England Patriots clearing up even more cap space by trading tackle Marcus Cannon to the Houston Texans. And what does that mean for them in free agency and who do I think they can go after? But of course, we're going to start with the big news of the day, that being Aaron Jones has re-signed with the Green Bay Packers on a four-year $48 million contract contract with a $13 million signing bonus. According to its agent, Drew Rosenhaus, he could have had better offers on the market, probably from teams like Miami, New York, maybe even San Francisco. But Aaron Jones wanted to stay with Aaron Rodgers in Green Bay and obviously work something out. It was huge. It was reported that they didn't franchise tag him because they thought they could get him under that cap value. They ended up paying more than that franchise tag. The franchise tag for a running back would have been about $8.3 
million dollars per year. Obviously, Aaron Jones just signed for about twelve to thirteen million dollars each and every year. I think it's a great pay, uh, you know, price for Aaron Jones. Obviously, I think he's a top three running back in football. Like I said in my last episode, there aren't many running backs that I would give top dollar to. I think running back is a position that can be easily sought after through the draft. There's always a lot of guys in the later rounds who end up rushing for a thousand yards right off the gate. We know the shelf life of a running back is not ideal. Usually, once guys get past. 27, 28, uh, they start to dip off a little bit unless you're like Adrian Peterson. We've seen Derrick Henry still look pretty good going up to that age. We've also seen like guys like Jamal Charles completely uh, look like a shell of themselves by the time they reach you know over that 30 years old thing. We already see Ezekiel Elliott. There's some rumors that he's already on the decline given his age. And uh, you know Aaron Jones being re-signed though is a running back that I would pay for because of how good he is in the pass game and just as an offensive weapon. He can pass block for you. He can obviously play as a pretty much an outside receiver. He's caught a couple of deep balls for touchdowns. Again, 35 touchdowns in 34 games. Like I said, I did not expect him to be back in Green Bay. This was pretty surprising to me. Green Bay technically, or usually I should say, doesn't overpay for their free agents, doesn't uh, extend a lot of guys, doesn't give top dollar to a lot of people. They've given them to three people recently, Aaron Jones, now uh, Devontae Adams, and of course Aaron Rodgers. I still believe Aaron Rodgers is going to be re-upped for that contract. There hasn't been a lot of reports on it. I was speculating in my last episode that that's where the Green Bay money could be going. Obviously, $12 million of it is going to Aaron Jones. That's not all of the space they have after they've done some restructuring. I still expect Aaron Rodgers to be re-upped to at least a $40 million a year range. And again, I think that this is going to be weird because you have to look at last year's Packer draft class. And the first two picks being Jordan Love and the second pick being A.J. Dillon. And the two biggest moves that Green Bay might be making this offseason is extending their running back Aaron Jones and extending their quarterback. So you have to take a look at at top down of why were those draft picks selected? Will Aaron Jones and A.J. Dillon ever get a major, major role with the Green Bay Packers? Because again, otherwise the 2020 draft class pretty much goes out the window for them. Again, those were their two first picks. A.J. Dillon picked in the second round, and then they traded up for Jordan Love in the first round. But again, going back to Aaron Jones, I I do believe that this was a good signing for the Green Bay Packers. Again, their offense revolves around those three players, Aaron Jones, Aaron Rodgers, Devontae Adams. They are losing a major, major player uh, at Corey Lindsay at center. Some people would argue he's the best center in the draft. Uh, He's a center in a Kyle Shanahan type offense, which literally means that there are certain plays and specifically run designs and schemes that you can call because Corey Lindsay is your center versus any other regular center in the NFL. Because of how athletic he is, what he does with schemes and blocking patterns and getting off the line quickly, he matters so much to a run game that he's already been priced out of Green Bay. And I really look at two teams, the Miami Dolphins, New York Jets. I really look at the New York Jets for this one in particular. I don't necessarily see the Miami Dolphins making... Corey Lindsay, the highest paid center in the league. I think the Dolphins are more interested in a guy like David Andrews, who would be a, again, I think David Andrews is a top five center in the league. He's not the best. Corey Lindsay's definitely the best center in the league. Uh, but again, Andrews is a little bit younger, not a huge dramatic drop off in that Patriot connection. I think that's who Miami's after at center. But Green Bay is going to have a center position they're going to have to fill. I look at a guy like Creed Humphrey. I would pencil that name in as the first round selection for the Green Bay Packers. If you're a Packer fan, you should totally check out uh, some of those highlights from the lefty center out of Oklahoma, Creed Humphrey, absolutely dominated senior bowl from start to finish. Uh, best center of the draft class easily. That's going to be their number one need now, in my opinion. They have some issues on the defensive end for sure. Green Bay, they just coming off that NFC Championship game where they obviously lost to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Aaron Rodgers, again, I do believe he's going to be re-upped on that contract. So that core of that team is staying together. That core being... Aaron Rodgers, Aaron Jones, Devontae Adams. They definitely need some more bolstering on the defensive end. I thought they would be all over guys like Devontae David and J.J. Watt. Those guys are already with new teams. I don't know who Green Bay is going to go after defensively, but I would check a look. I would take a look at some veteran defensive linemen, maybe a new linebacker, even look at that secondary a little bit too. But most importantly, the number one thing they're going to have to do is get a new center because Corey Lindsay was an absolutely huge part of this offense, bigger than you will know uh, if you're a casual football fan. But again, if you take a look at the film, you take a look at the breakdown, Corey Lindsay is a major, major part of that offense. He's the fourth most important player on that offense, right? We obviously know Aaron Rodgers is the most important player on that offense. Uh, Probably Devontae Adams, too. Aaron Jones, three. Corey Lindsay is the fourth most important player on that offense. And most importantly, the most important teammate, really, to Aaron Jones is Corey Lindsay, not necessarily Aaron Rodgers. Corey Lindsay has a more of a direct impact 
on Aaron Jones's game than Aaron Rodgers does. So they're going to have to fill that center position. It's obviously also important to keep Aaron Rodgers upright. A center will help you do that as well. So it's not all just about the running game. But again, keep an eye on Creed Humphrey. He's big, athletic, out of Oklahoma. Would have been a great prospect last year. He decided to stay for his senior season at OU. Again, absolutely dominated the uh, senior bowl practices from start to finish. Was probably the best offensive lineman prospect there. Again, a lot of mock drafts have him going in the late first round. I would pencil that name in for Green Bay. Again, Green Bay needs some other things too. They don't have a lot of money. I think they need another receiver. I'd like them to take a look at a guy like Nelson Aguilar, get a pure speed guy for Aaron Rodgers. Rondell Moore is a guy I've been talking about a lot on the show. I think he'd be a great fit in Green Bay as well. But now that they need that center position really isolated and absolutely taken care of, because it's a fact now that Corey Lindsay is not coming back to Green Bay since they paid Aaron Jones this money. So they, it's sort of a little bit of give and take. In my personal opinion, I didn't see Green Bay going this route. I thought they would prioritize bringing back Lindsay or helping defense than bringing in uh, Aaron Jones back, considering they do have A.J. Dillon on the roster, who was a second-round pick, whether you agree with the second-round pick or not. They took him that high because they believed he could have been a real impact player. He sort of came alive in the playoffs last year. He's a big physical back. It takes running backs a little bit of a minute to adjust to the NFL. Uh, But again, we saw that even with Jonathan Taylor on the Colts. Had a little bit of a slow start, then really came out at the end and now looks like a budding star in this league. And sort of A.J. Dillon had a similar route, but not not to the quite as, as a good level, if that makes any sense. So, again, slow start really came out at the end for A.J. Dillon, but it never was that peak that we saw of, you know, Jonathan Taylor was winning the Colts football games. A.J. Dillon was never winning the Green Bay Packer football games. Not that that was the expectation, but now that Aaron Jones is back... Uh, again, Corey Lindsay definitely hitting the open market. I would keep an eye on the New York Jets. That just makes the most sense for me. They're running a Shanahan-style team. Uh, again, it's looking like they're going to move off of Sam Darnold, trade him to a team like Chicago or Washington, uh, draft a guy like Zach Wilson, mobile quarterback in a Shanahan-type system. They need that running back and center pairing. I don't know where they'll get the running back from. Uh, they were a name to keep an eye on with Aaron Jones, and so was Miami as well, and I'll talk about them later. Uh, So they're sort of off on the free agent running back market. There's guys like Kenyon Drake out there, guys like James Conner out there. The big name on the running back market right now is Chris Carson. He's got banged up in some injury issues. He's not necessarily a Shanahan-style running back, so I don't know how involved the Jets will be on that. Wouldn't surprise me if Miami took a look at uh, it that way now since Aaron Jones is off the market. I know they were high on him. It's going to be interesting to see play out for sure. But when it comes to the Green Bay Packers, they got to get that center position taken care of, and they got to get that defense taken care of. This NFL offseason has been absolutely brutal to veterans with all of these cuts because of the uh, the salary cap decretion because of the COVID year. Uh, Green Bay's got to be all over these veterans who are going to try to sign one-year contracts to get paid again when the cap goes back up next offseason and obviously when the new mega dollar uh, TV deal is announced as well. So I'd go all in on some of these one-year deal free agents, specifically on the defensive side of the ball. Maybe look at receiver in the second round, but definitely draft Creed Humphrey in the first round if I were the Green Bay Packers. What I will say, though, for Green Bay is this is a nice change of pace. Uh, While I was surprised by the move that they brought back Aaron Jones, it was a welcomed surprise. Again, Green Bay, for years and years with Aaron, has never gotten him the proper help, has never gotten him the proper weaponry to really be able to succeed at the highest level each and every year, whether it was poor offensive lines, poor defenses, poor receivers. They finally got a good running back in Aaron Jones, and they paid him and they brought him back. They finally got a good uh, wide receiver in Devontae Adams. They pay him, they bring him back. They'll do the same thing with Tanyan. It's good that when Green Bay finally does have weapons, because for years Green Bay is struggling to be, you know, get weapons and put them around Aaron Rodgers and things like that. But sometimes when they would get those weapons, they would let those guys walk because Green Bay historically doesn't pay their free agents a ton of money. Not a lot of guys want to play there long term because of the destination and things like that. So it's a nice change of pace to see those key guys who are helping Aaron Rodgers get to the, you know, you know, NFC Championship game year in, year out, or just compete for playoff, you know, deep playoff runs. It's good to see your quarterbacks at the biggest stage. That's what we all want as NFL fans. We want our best quarterbacks and our best players playing in the most important games. Aaron Rodgers can't do that without those weapons. It's a nice change change of pace to see Green Bay re-sign those guys. Again, to wrap up this segment, this really affects two teams, the New York Jets and Miami Dolphins. Those were the two guys, or teams I should say, that were really going to go after Aaron Jones, teams that needed to boost all their running game for their young quarterbacks, Zach Wilson for the New York Jets eventually, Tua Tungavailoa for the Miami Dolphins now. I think I was surprised again that Aaron Jones was brought back. Uh, specifically brought back before even listening to offers from Miami and New York. Again, like Drew Rosenhaus said, he could have gotten higher money elsewhere, most likely Miami or New York, but he wanted to stay loyal to Green Bay and come back and play with Aaron Rodgers. That was surprising to me. As a running back, 
I would expect a lot of guys to cash in because their shell lives are not like quarterbacks that can't play till they're 33, 34, 35. They don't have 10 to 15 years left in their career. They have a 10-year career total. So I expect I expected him to really cash in with a team like Miami or New York. But he's having success there. He's winning a lot of games there. And again, the million-dollar difference isn't going to be a ton difference. I think he got 12 to $13 million from Green Bay. I expected him to get $17 million max from Miami or New York, but probably closer to $15 mil. So again, 2 to $5 million difference. Do you prioritize winning over that, staying in Green Bay, things like that? Aaron Jones is clearly a fan of the Green Bay lifestyle, their fans, their organization, everything like that. And he clearly loves playing with Aaron Rodgers and Devontae Adams as well. So, again, four-year extension, $12 million a year, $48 million in total, $13 million signing bonus, all for Aaron Jones. I think he's a top three running back in football. I think he's a fantastic offensive weapon. And I think it was a great signing for the Green Bay Packers, specifically at the price that they got him. All right, that's going to do it for this segment. On the other side of this short break, we'll be getting in to the Cam Newton signing for the New England Patriots. He is back on a one-year deal that is filled with incentives, could go all the way up to $14 million. Was it the right call? And what are the Patriots going to do with all of their cap space? We'll really do a New England Patriots State of the Union coming up right after this short break. Are you looking for the very best NFL and college football podcast? Then check out the GSMC Football Podcast. Get the latest football news both on and off the field. From the NFL draft to trades to the rumor mill to the NFL combines. They got you covered. That's gsmcpodcast.com backslash football dash podcast. Get updates on college rivalries, game day insights, and much, much more. It's football talk the way you want it. This show eats, sleeps, and breathes football. Don't Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info. And we are back here at the GSMC Sports Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. Again, I am your host, Alex Masfer. Thank you so much for tuning into today's episode and to be continuing to listen to the show. If you are a returning listener, we really do appreciate you. Uh, I just finished giving you my spiel on the Aaron Jones signing for the Green Bay Packers. Again, I didn't think Green Bay would take it in this direction. I thought that they would prioritize a guy like Corey Lindsay, who, again, might be the best center in the draft or in the uh, entire league, I should say. Again, keep an eye on the New York Jets, maybe the Miami Dolphins, but I would really lock in on the New York Jets as a team that might throw Corey Lindsay in the bag, maybe even the Jacksonville Jaguars as well. Uh, he's going to come at a premium position because, again, centers have a lot to do with your run game, specifically in a Shanahan style offense, which is what all the rave is about right now in the NFL, everyone's trying to run a Shanahan-style offense. It makes running backs uh, look phenomenal in the system. It's very RB-friendly. It's very quarterback-friendly. Uh, a lot of guys have a lot of success and have their best years in the Shanahan system. You look at Jimmy Garoppolo. You look at uh, Matt Ryan when he was uh, with uh, Kyle Shanahan and with the Falcons, I think, in 2018. So you know that the Shanahan system is going to get your quarterbacks and your running backs to look really, really nice. And if you're creative enough, it can get your receivers with all the motioning that it does uh, open faster, get them in their ball hand, get the ball in their hands quicker as well. And it's all about playmakers in the Shanahan style offense. Corey Lindsay helps that, but Green Bay does retain their playmaker in Aaron Jones. And again, not the direction I thought they would go, but I am happy to see Aaron Rodgers continually have weapons so we can see him on the biggest moments in the biggest stage. I want to transition now here to the New England Patriots, who are one of the more fascinating and less talked about teams when it comes to free agency. They have the third most cap space in the NFL only behind the New York Jets and the Jacksonville Jaguars. And it's unclear the com- the direction that they're going to go because a couple of weeks ago and really a couple of days ago, I- I- we've all been talking about who is going to be the next New England Patriot quarterback. Are they going to go after Marcus Mariota? Are they going to maybe even draft a guy like Mac Jones or maybe trade up for a, a Justin Fields or-, or a Trey Lance? But in fact, they bring back Cam Newton on a one-year $5 million deal base salary with incentives that can go all the way up to $14 million. So when you see the headline that it was a $14 million deal, I would 
Again, that's a lot of incentives throughout the contract. Probably a playoff incentives, a game started incentive, a passing yards incentives, a passing touchdown incentive, uh, awards incentives. So again, it's that's not going to be the full details of the contract again because it's unlikely Cam Newton will hit all those incentives probably and get all the way up to fourteen million. But it is a five million dollar base salary. So again, the New England Patriots get their quarterback back. On the cheap. Now, the initial report was well, just because they bring back Cam Newton, that doesn't mean they're done looking in the quarterback market. I don't know how much I buy that because, again, Cam Newton doesn't scream like a guy who would be willing to resign in New England or come back to that team that, again, he's been heavily criticized throughout his time in New England, even though just one year. Um, and, and again, there was the report that they were done with him, that they were going to move on. But again, now he's brought back. I don't think Cam Newton goes back to the Patriots unless he knows for a fact, hey, I'm going to be starting for this team next year. Because there was a chance he could have looked into some other teams. Uh, a team like Washington maybe could have gone to him if the quarterback market dried up. His history with Ron Rivera there. I thought that could have been interesting. But at the end of the day, he comes back to New England. Again, $5 million. I think this was the best situation for Cam. It's the best chance for him to start uh, over any other team. Again, I would have liked to see Cam in maybe Washington, but that would have meant that Sam Darnold went somewhere else, uh, Mariota went somewhere else, and they didn't get a guy in the draft. So that would be sort of a last option for Washington. But for Cam, he wants to come back to New England. He wants to play with that Belichick defense, and he just has to hope that they get better weapons for him. Now, my issue with the can sign is a couple of things. One, the Patriots, you know, the, the, the struggles last year with the offense are not all Cam Newton's fault. It's, it's unfair to put every single struggle with the Patriots offense last season on Cam Newton. But he does share a large part of the blame. While the receivers and running backs weren't great, he was making terrible throw after terrible throw last year, hitting receivers near their feet, throwing low balls constantly, underthrowing balls constantly. And again, he's the first quarterback since the 1930s to start 15 plus games and throw less than 10 touchdowns. That's not a list you want to be a part of if you're Cam Newton. But even if the weapons that New England is going to go after, who I will talk about later on in this segment, are acquired by them, I don't know that even if Cam had decent weapons, because I don't think there's an easy pathway for New England to go from the worst weapons in the league to one of the best, but there is a pathway to go from the worst weapons in the league to at least average. And let's say Cam Newton does get average weapons. He already has a decent offensive line, a decent running game. I think a I think an above average offensive line for sure. I'd probably say an above average running game. Let's say they get a guy like Corey Davis and they also draft the receiver. And maybe they get a tight end like Gerald Everett, Hunter Henry that they're talking about potentially going after. I don't know in this division with the Miami Dolphins looking the way that they look with Brian Flores. They just made a trade for an all pro linebacker. With the Buffalo Bills pretty much running it back with the same exact roster as last year, uh, pretty much exactly to down to pretty much each and every player. Same exact coaching staff because, again, Brian Dable did not get, you know, a head coaching opportunity somewhere, which really surprised me. I thought he was the most head coach ready coordinator out there. And again, Buffalo is a pass happy offense. So all of these wide receivers that are going to hit the free agent market are going to want to go to Buffalo on a one year deal because of the cap situation, obviously over the course of the entire league. And there's a ton of wide receiver free agents this year. So again, Buffalo's going to get better. Miami's going to get better. The Jets just hired Robert Sala. They're a couple years away from really contending, but Zach Wilson's going to be fun and exciting. They have the second most cap space in the league. It's looking like they might go get a guy like Corey Lindsay, who in my opinion is the best center in the league. So the Jets are all also leveling up. I don't know what Cam Newton does for you in the short term or the long term. And if it's just to try to sneak into the playoffs next year, I'm not sure if he's going to be able to accomplish that. I think next year the AFC East is already sending two teams to the playoffs. Buffalo, who's probably going to be the division winner. And I think Miami next year wins at least another game or two just because they're going to get more weapons for two or they're going to get a year older. They're the second youngest roster in the league as well. So if they get 11 wins, that means they're in. That's two playoff teams. When you're competing with teams like the Colts, the Titans, the Ravens, the Browns, and maybe even the Steelers if they can improve their running game, then I don't see how Cam Newton and a division you know that's so tough defensively, so hardly coached. Again, so many great coaches in the AFC East. The AFC in general is loaded with quarterback talent, and the Patriots would be near the bottom of it because Cam Newton, in, in all honesty, looks like a shot fighter at this stage. And I love Cam the guy. I don't. I never understood the hate of him as being a leader. I think he's a fantastic person, a fantastic teammate, an awesome player. He was an awesome player to watch. But now Cam Newton's a shot fighter that can do more with his legs than his arm. And that's not good for Cam Newton because he's had a lot of injuries with those legs. And he's taken a lot of hits over the years. And there's a lot of miles on those tires. And just another year of Cam, I really didn't think the Patriots were going to go this route. It screams desperation for me. It screams, uh, again, when this is what it sort of reminded me of. If you all remember... 
a couple weeks ago, Matthew Stafford went to the Los Angeles Rams in a mega trade, and one of the teams that was really, really trying to get Matt Stafford was the New England Patriots. And the message was clear from Matt Stafford to the to the Detroit Lions, who wanted to do right by him. He stuck it out through terrible, terrible years in Detroit, and again, they wanted to do right by him and, and put him in a place where he could, you know, succeed, potentially compete for a championship. They essentially wanted to be nice to him and put him into a destination where he wanted to go. And his message was clear. Anywhere but New England. Any winning team but New England, I don't want to play there. And it seems like the only quarterback maybe on the market, again, the legal tampering period doesn't start till actually today when you're listening to this on Monday. Again, that's when the legal tampering period starts. And it's not just, you know, let's be real. Through the back channels of the NFL, through agents, teams have already been talking to players, gouging interest. Would you want to be a play here? Blah, blah, blah. It wouldn't surprise me if the New England Patriots, through the back channels of agents and just the NFL in general, sort of felt out the quarterback market and realized guys like Mariota, some of these other free agents might not want to come here and play in New England. Similar to how Matt Stafford didn't want to play. You know who still wants to play in New England? Cam Newton, because he really has no other place to go and start. So it screamed of desperation to me it's screened of this is the only guy who wants to play for us if I were the Patriots I'd try to move up in the draft get a tra- Justin Fields a Trey Lance again that's not a very Patriot-esque move they have a lot of money in free agency I do think they're going to use it they just made another trade they traded Marcus Cannon uh, the right tackle back to Houston to free up even more cap space keep an eye on a couple of players here Curtis Samuel is going to be a name they're going to throw the bag at very versatile wide receiver sort of a wide receiver running back high rid but at a super Star level, uh, he's really good at that stuff. I could see them throwing the back at him. A guy like Corey Davis. Tight end under Hunter Henry is another name to keep an eye on for the New England Patriots. Bill Belichick and him are actually family friends. Uh, but he did say he was prioritizing good quarterback playing for agency. Uh, going from Cam, from Justin Herbert to Cam Newton, in my opinion, would be a downgrade. So if he's looking to upgrade from Justin Herbert, he's going to go look at the contenders. I don't know if New England's considered that at this stage. So I think New England, while they do have a ton of money, is going to have to nail this draft and they're going to have to get some receivers for Cam Newton. But again, at best, I see this New England Patriot team winning nine games. And that's going to have to, you know, have a couple of games break your way. Cam Newton looked decent for at least half the season. And I don't know if he can do that. And while he was healthy last year, despite the COVID issue, I really do believe that he is still not considered a reliable, available player as of right now. Good job getting healthy through last season, but we know that the injuries are still lingering. I understand that another year in the Patriots system will definitely help Cam. And I'm not saying he's necessarily going to look worse than he did last year, which was just purely awful from a pass throwing standpoint. I just don't think that even if Cam does have some slight improvement from better weapons and the system, it's going to get you over the hump and get you in the AFC playoffs. Again, the AFC is absolutely stacked. Better than the NFC, in my opinion, when it comes from talent top down. From quarterback play, it's not even a close from a, from an AFC versus NFC perspective. And in the AFC, you need a really, really good quarterback to make the playoffs. And the Dolphins, like, you know, last year missed the game because some team, they had Tua Tunga Vailoa, a rookie, and he just wasn't ready to make that play yet. The New England Patriots have Cam Newton. I don't think he's ever going to get back to that level to make that play, to get you in the playoffs, to win 10 games, to win 11 games. It didn't even, you know, 10 games in the AFC, you missed the playoffs. Can we get the New England Patriots to go 11-5 and five with Cam Newton as the quarterback? I don't know if that's possible. Not in the AFC East, not in that great defensive and coach division. I don't know if it's possible for Cam. But again, if I were the New England Patriots... Again, I don't buy the report that they're also going to make a move and add another quarterback. I think Cam's going to be their guy at least next year. Wouldn't surprise me if they draft a quarterback in the draft, whether it's in the first round versus the third round. That's the better question. But I would try to get as many receivers for Cam Newton as possible. Throw the bag at Kenny Galladay, the Detroit Lions wide receiver, superstar. Not great health-wise, but again, is the best wide receiver on the market since Allen Robinson got tied. Go throw him a blank check. Throw Curtis Samuel a blank check. Throw uh, Corey Davis a blank check. Same thing with Hunter Henry and Gerald Everett. The New England Patriots. Patriots need playmakers again. They haven't had playmakers in really a couple seasons, going all the way back to Tom Brady's last year. There have been no playmakers on this New England Patriots roster, quite frankly, since John Gronkowski retired. So that needs to change. It starts with speed on the perimeter. It starts with a dynamic tight end again. They can do that. They have the money and the draft capital to do it. Will Bill Belichick, the GM, be able to? That's a better question because I'm starting to question Bill Belichick. Not the coach. I think he's one of the greatest, if not the greatest, football coach of all time. But Bill Belichick, the GM, hasn't drafted a pro bowler since Rob Gronkowski, at least on the offensive side of the ball. And again, he struggles to draft weapons. Nikhil Harry's already reportedly on the trade block two years in. He's a bust. 
they always have a good offensive line. They always have a good defense. If I'm the Patriots, I'm moving off of Stephon Gilmore. You know Bill Belichick's going to find a corner to replace him that's going to do at least something that Stephon Gilmore does and be able to replace the gap. Pay J.C. Jackson, trade Stephon Gilmore to the Cleveland Browns for a first or something like that. Get more money. Get more weapons on offense. The defense is always going to be good for New England. Bill Belichick could coach up a middle school defense to compete at someone at the NFL level, I swear to God. But it's the offense that really needs to take off for this team. And for that to happen, they need speed. They need playmakers. And that's just, quite frankly, not what they have right now in New England. I'm happy for Cam that we get to see him start again. Cam Newton, again, when he was at his peak, was one of the best and most fun players to watch in the NFL easily. But it's been a major fall from grace since then. If Cam Newton was going to have the... you know, this big revival of his career. It had to start last year. It didn't. I don't see an easy or really clear way that Cam Newton makes some ginormous leap and saves the New England Patriots and is definitely the successor to Tom Brady like everybody was hoping and wishing, at least Patriot fans were, that he could be last year. I don't think he proved enough last year to be brought back. But to be back, again, if you're going to bring him back, they bring him back on the cheap. And maybe, again, through the back channels of the NFL, they found out that not a lot of these free agent uh, quarterbacks are going to want to play for them. They could have also made the internal decision, hey, we're not trading up for a guy and we're not in love with Mac Jones. So let's just bring Cam back with another year with more weapons. Again, throughout the year, Bill Belichick did rant and rave on how much he loved Cam's personality and grit and toughness and all that stuff. But that only goes so far. You need talent to win in the NFL. I don't know what's there talent-wise left for Cam, at least with his arm. He ran for 10-plus touchdowns last year. He's still mobile. He's still a dual threat for sure. But at this point, he's a better runner than a passer. And that's not going to win games in the NFL. It's just not. All right, that's going to do it for this segment. On the other side of this short break, I want to get to a couple of other major pieces of NFL news. One of them being the Miami Dolphins trade that I talked about earlier in this segment. Uh, They trade for an all-pro linebacker from the Texans. What does it mean for that defense? And where could the Dolphins go in free agency now that Aaron Jones is off the market? And where do I expect them to go in free agency? We'll do sort of a state of the union on the Miami Dolphins and why I think they could be making a big leap next year right after this short break. Check out the show that's built on the MMA. From the UFC to extreme cage fighting, they got the fights covered. Check out the GSMC MMA podcast. Get the latest news on past or upcoming fights. Join us as we talk to and about some of the biggest names in the MMA, past, present, and future. When it's the fight game, there's just one show to check out. GSMCpodcast.com backslash MMA dash podcast. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit G. SMCpodcast.com for more info. Back here at the GSMC Sports Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. Again, I am your host, Alex Masford. Thank you so much for tuning into today's episode and for continuing to listen to the show. If you are a returning listener, we really do appreciate you. I just finished giving you my expert take, I would say, on the entire New England Patriots uh, situation, really. Again, I, I don't hate Cam Newton. Again, I thought he was so much fun to watch years ago. But at this point, just his lack of ability in the passing game and his strugglings of throwing the ball downfield is why I don't really believe he can ever get back to the form that we all really hoped Cam could get back to. I think last year would have been the year to prove at least that there's some part of that Cam Newton left. He kind of showed that with his legs. Again, running for double-digit touchdowns is absolutely incredible. And I don't want to take that aspect of his game away from him. He definitely showed more athleticism than I thought he would have. But the fact that this, the fact of the matter is that at this stage of Cam Newton's career, he's a better runner than a passer, and that doesn't necessarily translate to winning football games uh, in the National Football League anymore. So I don't think Cam Newton was the right guy to bring back if you're New England. Again, it, it, it kind of just feels like a little bit like desperation from the Patriots and Bill Belichick's end. But now their number one goal definitely has to be to get 
weapons around Cam Newton. All right, now I want to transition to another AFC East team that made a big-time trade today in the NFL. The Miami Dolphins traded Shaq Lawson, a pass rusher they signed a year ago for about $10 million a year, and a sixth-round pick uh, over to Houston for former All-Pro slash Pro Bowl linebacker uh, Bernardrick McKinney, who is an absolute monster in the run-stopping game. Uh, fantastic when it comes to a big-time hitter reading gaps properly. Still in his prime, about to turn 29 years old. He's actually a little bit cheaper than Shaq Lawson is. He's a little bit older. Two completely different positions. And uh, this was an absolute home run uh, trade by the Miami Dolphins. They obviously recently cut Kyle Van Noy which was a surprise veteran cut. It was also one of the really the first veteran cuts that we saw uh, that would lead to a lot more of guys who just have put in a lot of good years with a lot of different teams or that team last year. But because of the salary cap situation and COVID this year, it it just had to be, there's going to be some money issues. It's going to be tighter with the salary cap. Teams also still want to be big spenders, like the Miami Dolphins want to be big spenders on offense. So guys like Kyle Van Noy get cut. They needed a new linebacker. I honestly thought they would look at a guy like maybe Brandon Browning out of Ohio State in the draft, Xavier Collins, but they opt to go for a trade uh, with Houston here. And again, he's a pretty good blitzing linebacker too. He's been in the league the last four seasons uh, and three times in his career, he's been in the top 10% when it comes to blitz rate for linebackers, which is great. And he's got an 11% uh, rush rate, which is pretty good when it comes to a linebacker. Again, he's going to play that middle linebacker type role. They have two other linebackers down there in Miami, one of them being Jerome Baker, seven sacks last season. He's going to get after the quarterback. Uh, same thing with Andrew Van Ginkle. And now you inject uh, uh, Bernardo McKinney, who is just a leader of that defense in Houston. Again, Houston's purging continues. They bring in Marcus Cannon out. Uh, Bernard Rick McKinney, maybe out Deshaun Watson, who knows, eventually. But it looks like they're taking calls on everybody else uh, but Deshaun. But sticking with the Miami Dolphins, it's clear that they are all in on this defense. Brian Flores is a master of disguise when it comes to defense and sort of his amoeba style uh, when crowding the line of scrimmage. He needs versatile linebackers. I think this was a home run trade for them. McKinney's a high IQ linebacker uh, in his prime. It's also nice to see the Dolphins at a veteran. I really like the direction the Dolphins are going with this youth rebuild and everything, but they're ahead of schedule. They weren't supposed to be as good as they were last year. They were supposed to be a mediocre, in my opinion, 8-18. and 18. They exceeded expectations, were 10-6. and six. Uh, Still uncertain about the quarterback in the future, but I think right now I still believe in Tua Tungavailo. I think he needs a proper sort of testing to see how he does with a you know a new system, a better system with the two new co-offensive coordinators down in Miami, Eric Studsville, and of course Godsey as well. New weapons, hopefully in Miami as well. New offense. We'll see how Tua does in year two uh, before any discussions about moving off him again, unless it's for Deshaun Watson. But when it comes to Miami, this defense is going to be electric. You already know that. Uh, I cannot wait to see how they do uh, just with the different packages that they're going to bring with McKinney now. And I think that defense is set. But since Aaron Jones re-signed with Green Bay, that was the number one free agent I thought Miami was going to go after. I thought when they cut um, Kyle Van Noy, that was the money that they were going to use to give Aaron Jones. But now they don't need to give that money to Aaron Jones, of course, because he's been re-signed. And McKinney isn't even that much of a cap hit. They don't have to, you know, trading for McKinney didn't uh, cut any cap for them or gain any cap. It was sort of a wash. It's same input in, input out sort of thing. They made the money work really nice that way with this trade. So at the end of the day, they still have that same amount of cap space, about $33 million. Who is Miami going after? That is the big question now. And I think as, you know, the tampering period begins, I'm going to be fascinated to see who the Miami Dolphins target. Will it be a guy like Curtis Samuel? Will they go all in on a pass rusher? That's the one thing that this defense is missing. I think they're a top three secondary in the NFL. I think with the addition of McKinney, I think they have the potential to be one of the best linebacking cores in the NFL now as well. Uh, uh, Andrew Van Ginkle made a lot of big time plays for that Miami Dolphins defense down the stretch. If you look at that Kansas City game, multiple tip balls. He's returned things to touchdowns. Uh, He's a really big impact player for that defense and he's really really young on a rookie contract I think he'll fill into Kyle Van Noy's role really nicely Jerome Baker super young electrically fast linebacker blitzing linebacker incredible quietly had seven sacks last year that's abnormal for a linebacker he's super young as well now you inject that veteran that true middle linebacker presence uh, and complete run stop stuffer uh, and tackling machine and McKinney great linebacking core they just need that pure pass rusher they have a really nice B pass rusher and Agba they nailed that free agency signing last year they have two to three great defensive tackles uh, I'm a big fan of Raekwon Davis the defensive tackle out of Alabama they drafted in the second round last year I believe he's like 6'7 
absolute beast. He's incredible. Christian Wilkins, I really like his football IQ. I think he's great. And Zach Steele is an underrated guy on that defensive line as well. They just need a, one more. Give me a pure dominant pass rush on that Dolphins defensive line. And I really do believe they could be the runaway defense uh, in this league. Could they throw that money at Shaq Barrett or a Carl Lawson from Cincinnati? Those would be two names I would keep an eye on. Jadavian Clowney even. A pure dominant pass rusher would really set this Miami, Dol- uh, Miami defense already at an elite level to all-time good level in my opinion, just with how good that secondary is and things like that. And of course, on the offensive end, I could totally see the Dolphins going after receivers like Juju Smith-Schuster and Curtis Samuel. Uh, and the running back thing is going to be really interesting because, of course, they don't land the guy they probably want in Aaron Jones. Do they hyper-focus on a guy like Chris Carson? I know Brian Flores is about toughness and physicality. Chris Carson probably best represents that. Maybe only Derrick Henry does a little bit more. But, again, Chris Carson gets a little bit banged up. There's also rumors that Buffalo is interested in him. Could they go all in on Chris Carter or Chris Carson and maybe outbid Buffalo and get that physical downhill north and south running back? I could see Miami going that route, too. But since Miami now can't go after Aaron Jones, I think they become one of the more fascinating players really in free agency because I think we have a lot of deals that are going to be released over even Monday and Tuesday before you know the, the new league year officially starts on Wednesday. There's going to be plenty of deals that are already agreed upon before Wednesday when they're officially signed. It wouldn't surprise me now that since Miami has all this extra money and they can't go after Aaron Jones, they screw up maybe somebody else's plans and maybe Miami signs a surprise guy. That's what I'm talking about with Shaq Lawson or, or not Shaq Lawson, um, Shaq Barrett or Carl Lawson. Those two guys I would keep an eye on. None of them are really rumored to go to Miami right now, but don't be surprised that since they can't get a guy like Aaron Jones, they go all in on this defense, maybe even a step further. Not only trading for that all-pro linebacker McKinney, but maybe throwing the bag at a big-time defensive end presence like Clowney, like Lawson, or uh, Shaq Bear, or they go on all on a receiver too. I could really see any of which way, or you know maybe a center, David Andrews, Corey Lindsey. It's going to be fascinating to see what the Miami Dolphins do this offseason. It all starts really today when you're listening to this uh, over the next few weeks. It's going to be a lot of fun to see how the new league year really plays out. The NFL offseason is really starting to pick up again. All right, we're going to take a final short break here, and the on the, on the other side of it, I want to get to two things. One, the Miami Heat, they are 10-1 in their last 11 games. Should Jimmy Butler be considered an MVP candidate and why I think college basketball has an absolute stud in the making. We'll get into all that great stuff right after this final short break. Are you looking for help for your fantasy football team? Check out the GSMC Fantasy Football Podcast. Get today's best advice on who to start, who to sit, even who you should draft. From sleeper picks to red-hot lineups, they got it all covered for you. That's gsmcpodcast.com backslash fantasy-football-podcast. We'll cover traditional leagues, dynasty, PPR, even IDP leagues. When you need fantasy help, there's just one show to hit up. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and Follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info. here at the GSMC Sports Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. Again, I am your host, Alex Masver. Thank you so much for tuning into today's episode and to be continuing to listen to the show. If you are a returning listener, we really do appreciate you. I just finished giving you my spiel and what I think the Miami Dolphins will do uh, uh, after the Aaron Jones signing with Green Bay. Again, they have all this extra money now. I really think they're going to throw a wrench in this sort of free agency plan that we've all sort of rumored and speculated about, again, starting today when you're listening to this. I really do believe that uh, now that Aaron Jones 
has been locked down and secured by Green Bay. Miami might go after somebody that they maybe weren't rumored to go after. A guy like Carl Lawson comes to mind. I think they really want to set a guy as a pass rusher. Keep an eye on Carl Lawson and Shaq Barrett. More Carl Lawson than Barrett because I think Barrett has a higher chance of retaining and staying in Tampa Bay and that Brady restructured his contract. But Carl Lawson lives and trains down in South Florida. I wouldn't be surprised at all if Miami locks down a 25-year-old pass rusher that has the potential with the right system and coach Brian Flores to be absolutely dominant. And I think that would be a home run signing for Miami. So keep an eye on that uh, today when you listen to this. Again, at noon officially is when that sort of tampering period is open. I think a bunch of deals and a lot of the major deals really should probably be get wrapped up before Wednesday even comes. So it's going to be a fantastic next few days for the NFL. I want to transition now to the NBA for a little bit here. And I want to talk about the Miami Heat because they started off the season so poorly and at one point were the 11th seed in the East. But over their last 11 games, they are 10-1 and with Jimmy Butler essentially averaging a 25-point triple-double with over three steals a game. Absolutely ridiculous type stuff. And what I want to talk about quickly is, should Jimmy Butler be in the MVP conversation despite not being an All-Star this year? Now, I think we all agree that if Jimmy Butler had been healthy and had not been diagnosed with COVID at the beginning part of the season, he would have made the All-Star game. I don't think that you know it wasn't a matter of, is he good enough to be an All-Star? We know Jimmy Butler's good enough to be an All-Star. But I think it's because of the lack of games he played that he didn't get in. But in my opinion, Jimmy Butler is a top 10 player in this league. And I don't know if anybody this season is more valuable to their team, besides probably like a guy like LeBron James, than Jimmy Butler. When they don't play, the Miami Heat, again, play like the 11th seed in the East. When Jimmy Butler is not on the floor for the Miami Heat, but even if Bam Adebayo is, but Jimmy Butler is not. It looks like the Miami Heat are a bottom tier East team. But when Jimmy Butler is playing... (laughs) They're a top four seed in the East. That's that's absolutely ridiculous. I don't know who else is making that impact besides a guy like LeBron James. Even the teams like the Nets are winning without KD and things like that. So I think Jimmy Butler has to seriously, seriously, seriously start to be considered in the MVP conversation. With all that being said, I still believe the Miami Heat need to make a move. The trading deadline is coming up. I think we should keep an eye on Victor Oladipo. I wouldn't surprise me if Miami moved off of Kendrick Nunn. They sold high on him. He's had a great month or so. Uh, while the Heat have really come on, he's come on. I wouldn't surprise if they separate Hero and Robinson. Both of them are really nice scorers, but they are terrible, terrible, terrible defenders. And they really get picked on on that end. So it wouldn't surprise me if the Miami Heat looked to split those guys up and keep one of them or trade the other one for a guy like Victor Oladipo. Victor Oladipo and the Miami Heat have essentially been flirting with each other for the last couple of years. And even recently, it's been expected that teams are worried about trading for Victor Oladipo because it's almost expected that he'll sign with the Heat in the summertime when he's a completely unrestricted free agent. Don't be surprised if the Heat, with the struggling Rockets, try to acquire both P.J. Tucker and Victor Oladipo. I could see those two guys coming over, the Heat sending over a guy like Duncan Robinson or something like that, or Kendrick Nunn, and that would be a major, major upgrade for the Miami Heat, specifically defensively as well. Over the last 11 games, they've probably been the best defensive team in the NBA. Jimmy Butler averaging almost three steals a game has a lot to do with that, obviously, but you add Victor Oladipo another guy who could be a for NBA all-first team defender. Pair him up with Jimmy Butler, Bam Adebayo. You're talking about an elite, elite defensive team, and that's how the Miami Heat are going to get back to the finals. Because again, you can score on Brooklyn. Because if, if we get to a wet Eastern Conference Finals, like I believe we're heading towards, which is going to be Brooklyn versus Miami, I think that's going to be the Eastern Conference Finals, if I had to say today. Uh, assuming the Heat make a trade, by the way. If they don't make a trade, I'm not sure they'll get back there. But assume they move for, for, for like a guy like Victor Oladipo. Then the Heat have the defense to just slow down the Nets a little bit. Then they can score all day on Brooklyn's terrible defense and potentially get back to the finals, which is what Jimmy Butler and the Miami Heat so desperately want. So it's going to be interesting to see how they play out sort of uh, when the you know trading deadline looms. Will they finally pull the trigger and get uh, Victor Oladipo in Miami like he wants to be? so badly. Switching to college hoops quickly, obviously March Madness is coming up. I watched a lot of the games, uh, a lot of the uh, tournaments for each conference, and so the number one guy that stuck out to me and who I wanted to watch was Cade Cunningham of Oklahoma State. He's the essentially the number one pick in the draft next year. Mobley, I think, out of USC is really, really good too. Uh, they lost, obviously, but I think he was fantastic in that game, and he reminds me a lot of Kevin Durant. But Cade Cunningham reminds me of a better version of LaMelo Ball. And LaMelo Ball is obviously taking the league by storm right now and is a runaway Rookie of the Year winner and candidate, in my opinion. But I think Cade Cunningham can be just as good as Zion Williamson. Zion Williamson was almost pronounced this superstar and savior, not not basketball scene, needed saving or anything, but a vibe like that, that he was this ultimate, ultimate prospect. I think Cade Cunningham is that good. 
Uh, if Cade Cunningham had gone to Duke, UNC, Kentucky, a big time program, gone to the tournament, just like Zion's path had gone, I think Cade Cunningham, the the brand, the person, would be even bigger than he is now. But he decided to go to Oklahoma State. Not that it's a bad program or anything, but he is fantastic for that team, and it, you should really check him out in the tournament if you're an NBA fan. He's going to be the runaway number one overall pick. He had 29 points uh, in their loss to Texas. He was not the reason why they lost. He's averaging almost 20 a game. He's fantastic defensively. His court vision is phenomenal, and he's a six eight point. Point guard, which is what the modern NBA is looking for. Uh, he's at the complete package. And again, if you think LaMelo Ball is really dominating and taking the NBA by storm right now, which he absolutely is for the Charlotte Hornets uh, and their quest for a playoff push, then you know for a fact Kate Honeyham is going to do some stuff like that. He, again, 6'8", long, incredible court vision, incredible defensive prowess, really smooth, silky dump, uh, jump shot that has great form. LaMelo's shot was a little broken heading into the NBA. They had to correct it a little bit, still are correcting it. Don't need to do that with Cade Cunningham. It's already an NBA-ready jump shot. And I think if you haven't checked him out in the tournament, I mean, no matter what your bracket says, put on the Oklahoma State game. You're going to want to watch Cade Cunningham play. The kid is absolutely electric, and in my opinion, he's becoming the runaway number one overall pick in this year's NBA draft. All right, that's going to do it for today's episode of the GSMC Sports Podcast. Again, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. Before I let you go, don't forget to subscribe to the podcast. Follow us on all social media platforms and leave us a five-star review. Again, please, please, please subscribe to the podcast. Uh, Leave us a five-star review and follow us on all those three social media platforms. Again, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Again, thank you so much for tuning in today's episode. I have been your host, Alex Masferrer, and I will see you all in the next one. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. From movies to music, from sports to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.